The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to remind you we have the, uh, for those of us that uh, haven't received the workbook, this would be real good. There's some things in the workbook uh, that are not in the original book, which is pretty amazing when the original book looks like a phone book. Uh, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, it is. This would be a good thing for uh, personal study. It can be used in many different ways, but personal study would be a good one. That's an ancient blueprint for the supernatural, for such a time as this, the lost teaching of the apostles. Um, this is like to preface that message with the fact that the Didache is not scripture, but even the early church father, which one was in particular, recommended it as reading. That's a oh, the Clement, Clement. All, all of the early church fathers recommended everybody read it. Um, but the Didache is an outline, and what I love about it for such a time as this is now we have the whole canon of Scripture, which they didn't have at that time. And they had to teach Gentiles. So obviously they had to use Old Testament Scriptures to teach them the Ten Commandments, and then they made it about 30. They had to break it down in little, little uh, mini parts uh, because you can't just say to a Gentile who had no Jewish foundation whatsoever, uh, thou shalt not kill. First of all, that's a bad translation. It's thou shalt not murder. And that that's, pertains to the innocent. Um, but they had to break it down to them so that they could take it little step by step in bite-sized pieces just what this new morality is going to be and that regardless of what you your culture told you this is what the word of God says but just think they didn't have they didn't have what we have as the New Testament and they taught them in a methodical order to love the Lord your God with all your heart they started there the God that made you and I thought it was very beautiful that it's an outline of you know if we were suddenly to have an increase, like it's been prophesied, of a billion soul harvest, what do you think discipleship is, handing them a Bible? That's not discipleship. Discipleship is how to take that precious Word of God, that whole counsel of God, and minister to it in a, in a systematic way that they could grow thereby. And that's really what the Didache did. It's an outline. So I'm saying... Well, some people say, well, we have the scriptures now. Why do we need the Didache? Because the Didache was an outline, just like a sermon has an outline. It's an outline on how to present the scriptures. How much more, if there was a huge cultural influx of new believers, how much more could we give the scriptural teaching of the outline of the Didache? I mean, we have both. We have both the scriptures that are complete in and of themselves, and yet... At the same time, how do we present it to people that are clueless? You might think that's a strong term, but in reality, our culture has so thoroughly indoctrinated non-believers that if they become a believer, they're going to need re-indoctrinated. They're going to have to, they're going to be, it's going to impact their value system. And on top of all of that, what we still need, even in the Christian culture that we have now of Seasoned saints need to review your foundational belief system. I love that one course that we do, I believe, because the early church did the same thing. They taught them the creeds. And they would, matter of fact, Peter's sermon in the book of Acts is a creed. It is a creed. It's not just a sermon, it's a creed. If you believe these things and then you hear someone else teach you things contrary to those things. If you hear anybody teach anything contrary to, well, that's to the Scripture, sure, but to what Paul taught 
in the book of Acts. I mean, uh, Peter, I'm sorry. What Peter taught in that sermon, it's a creed. Those are non-negotiables. You hear somebody teach something, you know, some people try to be relevant to a fault. Relevant nowadays has a tendency to mean like the culture. No, no, no. We don't want any new, we don't need a new teaching. We need a deeper, richer experience in the teachings that are available through the scriptures. So what we did, though, is we found that when we, I, I pastored for 20 years and did not learn as much as I learned in the 12 years of traveling church to church. Ah. And if you've worked in ministries where you're involved in multitudes of churches, you get a little bit of a glimpse of what's out there, strengths and weaknesses. And what we saw incorporated for such a time as this is the outline of the Didache to put in a strategic way to teach the scriptures to people, at the same time knowing that many of them will need the how-tos. You can't just say do it because the scripture says so. There are many people that need a little bit of instruction as how do I do that. Matter of fact, we just did it on the, uh, we had a lot of response from uh, when we were on Sid Roth this week. We're still on uh, in uh, different stations. But what's interesting is they, they, we did a little example of someone who uh, needed the uh, assurance of their salvation. Now, I would suppose most people don't need the assurance of their salvation. They have the assurance of their salvation. But what do you do if you have someone that's been in the church forever and they're not sure? You've heard stories of people have gone to the altar to get saved over and over and over again. What's missing if they're getting saved over and over again? The assurance that they did it right the first time. All right? But there's a little test. There's a how-to that could literally, we did it on the program, and boy, we get response from that. It was like, Audra, come on up here. I'm going to use you as an example. We're going to get you saved <laughs> over again. Here's what we would do. Say, say Audra, this is play acting here. This is not real. But she's in the church and she hears that message. She goes, I've always, I've always wondered if I was saved or not. I don't know what to do. I don't know. How do I do it? What, what, what do people say? Just believe. How well does that work? They've been trying to do that for a long time. Here's a little thing that we saw that worked 100% of the time. Assurance of your salvation means a title deed. Faith is the substance. Faith is not nothing. Faith is the substance. All right? Here's what we would do. Okay, right here is the epicenter of your spirit. That's the door of the heart. Not here. Here. When Jesus came in, you gave consent here, but you opened the door of your heart and you welcomed him in. All right? Now, here's what we do. Close your eyes. You know, when they close their eyes, most of the time they drop down to their spirit whether they know it or not. They're shutting out extraneous. I'm going to whisper a scripture in there, and all I want you to do is down here, this is also the seat of the emotions, the door of the heart, the will, where you open. But the seat of the emotions, you need emotions, and we're going to talk about that today. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a child of God. Does that resonate? Feel good? There's your assurance. You're born again. We can't do anything with you. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, we prayed with people and we said, how did that feel? And they said, bad. Well, guess what? You might just be religious. You might have been in the church a long time and never really asked Jesus to come in. Or you said a prayer and you did it mentally. Mental agreement is not a supernatural exchange. You need everything to take place down here from a supernatural exchange or a supernatural transaction. When you got saved, there was a supernatural transformation that took place in your heart. And uh, when we travel, we found people didn't know how to forgive. They were forgiving from the head. Something as simple as that. So we incorporated in this book, and I think this is going to be a real game changer in the days ahead when there's a huge harvest. It's going to take care of some of those 
how do you do that instead of just to just do it because the word says so. That I've seen a lot of people struggle over the years when we travel church to church with, I know what the Bible says, but here's someone telling you how to do what you already know you're supposed to do. Couple that with an outline of how the Didache laid out the scriptures to people who were clueless, to people who culturally didn't know right hand from their left hand. They didn't know right from wrong. They called the ditch the road, the road the ditch, and everybody else thinks like that, so therefore it must be true. Kind of like Facebook. If it's on Facebook, it's got to be true. <laughs> right? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So I'm actually going to pull some things out of the Didache. Uh, I don't know how far I'm going to get because I add, I'm adding to a lot of what's in there. But I wanted to talk today about the God emotions. It was a neglected area in the church because we're thinkers and we're word people. But word people have to know that the nature of God is love and holiness, and that will be the emphasis in the days ahead. You listen to the prophetic voices. It's going to be love and holiness, not one or the other. It's going to be both. And that is the character and the nature of God. And when we talk about something like the God emotions, that's all we're talking about is the fruit of the Spirit. All right? Just a different way of saying the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, Galatians 5.22. But there's only one fruit. All of those are manifestations of the love of God, the characteristic and the nature and the essence of God. So everything begins and ends with love. And what's interesting, when they taught the Didache, they couldn't teach these non-Jewish people like, what do we do? We don't have a New Testament yet. And we've got these Gentiles that want Jesus. What do we do? There's no New Testament. So they stayed in the apostles' teaching. And what did they teach them first? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, the God who made you. They didn't say the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. These are Gentiles. They were never in Egypt. The God that made you. And do you see the precision even in that statement? The God that made you, they were probably raised with ten different gods. No, this is the God, and there's no other God. And they could use the Old Testament scripture of Isaiah 43. I am, I am, and I really mean this. That's what I am, I am is. I am, I am your Savior, and there's none beside me. That's your Messiah. That's your Jesus that you're coming acquainted with. Whoa, my family's got like 20 or 30 gods now you're saying there's only one, the one that made me. That's right. But notice that the word fruit is singular. Love. One fruit, love. Joy is love rejoicing. Love is the nature and the character of Jesus in you. The kingdom of God is within you. All right? Peace is love ruling and resting. I love ruling and resting. God of peace will soon crush Satan beneath your feet. Whoa, it's quite militant then. When the peace of God rules, Jesus rules. Kindness is love caring. Goodness is love motivating. Faithfulness is love trusting. Meekness is love esteeming others. More important than yourself. Self-control is love restraining. The ability, when love restrains, it's power under control. The power is there to do something, but you choose to restrain yourself in the name of love. And actually, when you are under the control of the Holy Spirit, nobody can control someone who's under control when it's God. Otherwise, you will fight control with control. That's flesh. Now, here's what I want to cover something that's been neglected to some degree, and that is teaching the humanity of Jesus because we're going to come into a time when holiness and love is going to be the bottom assumption for even to move into greater works. You're, it's not, many will say to me, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devil? That's gifts, all right? And you could still be apart from God and the gifts function. But in the days ahead, we're going to have to look at 
functioning as a human. Jesus taught us what is human. Now, we use that in a negative way, don't we? I'm just human. <laughs> that means I blew it again, <laughs> and I'm just making an excuse by saying, I'm not perfect, I'm just human. But the humanity of Jesus was expressed, and when peace is evidence that he's being expressed, don't ever minimize peace. Peace is not nothing. Peace is the rule of God that crushes the enemy beneath your feet. He himself is our peace. Now listen to this. Um, as evidence of his lordship, how many say, I don't want Jesus to just be my savior. I want him to be Lord. Well, when you're walking in peace, he's Lord. When you lose your peace, he's still your savior. <laughs> but you're off, you're off course. The divinity, the divine humanity is the expression of God. This is where I want to see the church get to. I want you to be challenged. The divine humanity of Jesus was expressed through a human being. He took on flesh and he dwelt among us. But the highest level of communication is to be an expression. You'd think words are the highest form of communication. But if that word doesn't match the character and the nature of God, it's just words, words, words. Remember that in Pygmalion or My Fair Lady when they did the movie? Words, words, words. You tell me all the right stuff, but if you love me, show me. Hmm? Your actions should depict a behavior that is loving. And matter of fact, uh, Jesusly human. When we use the word human, I'm talking today, Jesus human. He showed us what it was like to be a human being by walking on planet Earth during his Earth walk. This not as an excuse, or I'm just human. <laughs> he showed us what divine humanity looks like. Matter of fact, in the four Gospels, I used to like to study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew was the kingdom, the king in the kingdom, you know. Uh, but Luke was the man, Jesus the man. And he depicted him uh, in a beautiful way throughout the Gospel of Luke as the man. Now, John was deity, the Son of God. And, and uh, <clears throat> Mark, the servant. And you can e even see that depicted in the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. No, we're not going to go there. Right? Those four elements of the four Gospels are beautifully portrayed in that. But Luke was perfect humanity. That's what he was displaying. This Jesus displayed as an expression, perfect humanity. He expressed it by the life that he lived. He expressed it by the death that he died. And then he expressed it by the things that he did. All right? But it, it was an all-encompassing expression, the highest form. Matter of fact, the highest form of, of, of expression was he was confident that he was expressing the Father so well that when Philip said, show us the Father, he said, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. That's expression. That's, there's an anointing on that. Right now we need that expression to flow through each and every one of us. Uh, what a, you know, uh, there's a deception for some Christians who think that if I don't talk, I'm somehow acting holy. People can read your spirit. You can fool people with your words. You can fool them with your gestures. But you can't hide the spirit that emanates from you. And being silent with an attitude, everybody knows. <laughs> you didn't fool anybody. There's a funny it's a little, uh, my little granddaughter, Haven, Jason said he told her to be quiet. She started playing the drums. Her idea of quiet was, I'm not talking. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow it didn't register that, that that's not quiet. <laughs> she had a point, right? That's like the people who are not talking, but they're shouting from their spirit at you. I got an attitude. Get out of my way. I'm in a huff, but you'll never know it because I'm not talking. Therefore, it is hidden. That's like a little kid under a blanket going, I can't see you, you can't see me. All right? But the fruit of the spirit 
is evidence that Jesus is living his divine humanity in us. And he wants to be and is a perfect expression of the Father. Um, I've shared this before too, um, <clears throat> that when the Lord took me in hindsight and showed me how uh, he had taken me to the school of the Spirit and how I had developed intimacy with God, he showed me how it was first, you have to be able to drop down, I mean, at any given moment and touch him. If you can't even do that, you need a how-to. You really do, because he's there. If you're expecting lightning bolts, that could be your problem. You have demands and expectations that are not realistic. Just think, there are people that are very wealthy that would give their life savings to have a moment's peace. And we have it in Jesus for nothing. Don't throw away something so precious. There's people on heavy medication that would love to feel peace without the medication. And the answer is in Jesus. He himself is our peace. He's been made peace unto us. Never minimize that. And that's the God. That is the character and the nature of God that crushes the enemy beneath your feet. You're yelling and shouting at the devil in the dark in fear does not accomplish anything. But the God of peace will crush the enemy beneath your feet. Why did he choose that name, the God of peace? Because he's trying to teach you lordship. He's trying to teach you when the peace of God rules, he rules. But it's a hard concept to get across because people interpret peace as nothing. Well, remember, with God, nothing <laughs> is impossible. So he's, he's there if you invited him in. All right? That's a joke. Okay. All right. I want somebody to go, where's that? No. I don't. Okay. But negative and positive aspects of being an expression of God. It's not just words, but it's a life that you live out before the world. The world's watching you. The world knows. As a matter of fact, many people don't believe because they say, if that's what Christianity is like, if it's like so-and-so, I'm not interested. Who was that, Mahatma Gandhi, that made that statement? I'd be a Christian if it wasn't for the bad behavior of Christians. Well, however, that's not an excuse either. So negative and positive aspects of being an expression of God, these are the things that we want to learn to cultivate. And I want to challenge, especially Kingdom Life Church, it's not how much Bible you know, it's how much it's affected your behavior and how much it's changed your life. And that temptation, anybody ever get tempted? <laughs> that temptation was tailor-made for you. So consider it pure joy in your next trial because it was tailor-made for you. If you're seeing the same thing over and over again, there's ways to handle that. We'll get to that. Um, I think this is going to be a two-parter because I can't possibly get past page one. I got ten, <laughs> ten, ten pages. But you could also, you could also read, it in the, read it in our book, except I'm going to expand a great deal compared to what's in the book. But you could probably read it faster than you could listen to me. In the ancient... An ancient blueprint of the supernatural. And it says the lost teachings of the apostles. It was lost till the 1870? 1873. 1873, to be precise. I have my little coach up here. I was with the 1870s. 1873, which is sad because what turned England upside down was the teaching of John Wesley. And what he did is he went back to he didn't go back to just history. He went back to first century Christianity when it worked. When they turned the world upside down. And they didn't even have a New Testament as we have yet. We are without excuse. Right? We have more. How did they turn that world upside down? And he went back to first century Christianity. Unfortunately, John Wesley went to be with the Lord before they rediscovered the Didache. Because that's really where his heart was. What did the early church fathers say? I mean the early, early church fathers. The ones who had actually had been presenced by the apostles under Jesus themselves. Now remember, the Didache is the teaching of the twelve apostles. They had first-hand knowledge from Jesus and the Old Testament. But they actually elevated that Old Testament to a messianic level. Jesus elevated the scriptures. 
So they had to teach what they heard firsthand from Jesus in the Didache and the Old Testament scriptures. And they turned the world upside down. John Wesley goes, he went back to first century. I don't care all the changes that take place uh, over the uh, decades and, and uh, hundreds of years. If it wasn't, matter of fact, one of the ways you test scripture is, was it initially stated in our gospel? Can you find it in the book of Acts? And did the original apostles teach it? Yeah, new ideas. Uh, right now, everybody wants to have a new idea or be relevant. This is the opposite of being relevant. This is going down to the core belief system of what the early church believed. There's a time of purification and fixing that foundation. And God's basically saying it's going to require you to come familiar with the God emotions. God, fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> The fruit of the Spirit is the reason God gave you emotions. For years, the church, in recent history, the church has taught those emotions are those things you got to stuff and ignore because they cause you problems. Well, why did God give them to you in the first place? He meant them to be conduits to experience the love, joy, peace, patience, to be an expression of him, he wants to flow through your emotion, not your carnal emotion. What's interesting is God saying, I want to first of all teach you to resist temptation. It's tailor made for you. Use temptation as a friend saying, I have a need in this area. <laughs> right? I mean, is that obvious? If you're tempted in something, you have a need in that area to get the presence of God, the peace of God ruling in that area, lordship. Make the supernatural transaction to do that. And you can do that very simply with forgiveness. But we, when we traveled, we found out people that were in the church 20, 30, and 40 years didn't know how to forgive from the heart. Matthew 18 says, unless you forgive from the heart. We had people go, uh, well, I, I, I want to forgive that, uh, that ex of mine, uh, my ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, ex-husband, ex-wife. I'm going to forgive them, uh, and I've been working on it for a year now. Wow, just think if it was that hard to get forgiveness when you got saved. As you received him, come into my heart, God, cleanse me of my sin. <sighs> Peace with God. That was instant, I'm sorry. That beginning, that first step was instant, and it says, as you received him, so walk. That means you're supposed to walk the same way. You're supposed to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle. We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people. It should be as natural as breathing. And if I've even heard crazy teachings like, well, forgive and live with the pain. He takes your pain and your sorrow when you forgive and repent, you get your peace with God. You don't live with the pain. You give him that pain. If you forgive and you still have pain, you did it mentally. You did not do it from the spirit. There was no transaction. And you'll probably do it over and over again or form a theology that forgiveness is very hard. That's all that's left to you. It's hard. It's not hard. It's you're trying to do in the flesh what you can only do through a supernatural exchange, and you do it from the heart. It's instant. Just like salvation, as you received him, so walk the same way. You put off the old man. We use OFF -F just to help people. That's an outline, by the way. That's not scripture. OFF. -F. <laughs> open. Say you're a non-believer. I open my heart whether I knew I did it or not. I receive forgiveness, F, open, F, forgiveness, F, fruit, or peace. I made my peace with God. So how do I walk? The same way. Put off, O-F-F, -F, the old man. Put on the new man, which is drop down. On, put on in your Bible is en duo, to sink into in order to be clothed. When you sink into his peace, it guards your heart and your mind. It's a supernatural transaction. So I put on the new man, but now I have to stay and continue with the off principle. 
I have to stay open to God. I have to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle, prompt forgiveness too. Not I'll think about it, maybe I'll deal with this later. In that meantime, you're walking with crud that is actually building momentum. People that wait and have a little temper tantrum before they finally deal, you're only making it harder. And you're not doing your physical body any help. <laughs> Emotions eventually affect your physical health. Left unchecked. Open, forgiveness lifestyle, walk in the peace of God or the fruit. That's how you put off the old man, put on the new. And see, what we saw was there's people that didn't know how to do this, and they were in the church 20 and 30 and 40 years. So what we need, and we're gloriously going to prepare a people, that when there's a huge harvest of totally clueless people, you're going to be able to give them the simple outline that's found in the Didache. You're going to give them the New Testament scriptures, which is what you're going to teach them, but you're going to teach them in a, in a, from the initial encounter to the subsequent relationship that ensues. That's what we need. I mean, let's face it, even tracks to get people saved are smart. A, ask Jesus to come into your heart. B, believe that you've received. C, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It's just an outline, but it actually makes sense for some people to know how to apply the Scripture. A, B, and C all had Scripture attached to them. The Didache has an outline for Gentiles who are coming out of a culture where they had multiple gods, no morality. And then they needed a structure to teach them the scriptures. They needed a, an encounter first with this Jesus the Messiah and the subsequent relationship that follows. After you've done this, do this. First they said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. So picture this clueless Gentile. And these apostles only have what they heard Jesus say in the Old Testament. And they've got this clueless Gentile who comes up and says, I've asked him into my heart, he's real, he's really real. They go, you know what the next step was? Now, that love that you just received, you love him back. We love because he first loved us. They say, you love him back. And you shall love the Lord your God, the God that made you. Now, there's two ways to live. There's the way of life and the way of death. And great is the chasm between the two. That was the next thing that I told them. You choose the way you live. What do we know in the New Testament scriptures say? You walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's two ways. As a matter of fact, they were called the way before they were called Christians. Because of their behavior, they turned the world upside down. We've got, you, you can't rely on gifts to turn the world upside down. Not if they look at your behavior and they go, mm. hmm. To serve and worship the Lord in a proper way, we need the humanity of Jesus to express himself through us, and that's going to require a working knowledge of the fruit of the Spirit. I'm sorry. Jennifer and I both growing up in Christianity and uh, my early years in the church, uh, they would teach the kids in Sunday school the fruit of the Spirit. And they'd put a cornucopia up there and they'd have love, joy, peace. You could teach that till the cows come home if it's never part of your life. You could know all about it. Jennifer went to a conference in Georgia on joy and nobody had any. <laughs> but they could tell you everything that the scripture says about joy. We got to move beyond that and be the expression of the humanity of Jesus through our lives. Amen. Right? Now, just think about it. We know what the fruit of the Spirit, but God wanted you to be a transmitter of the fruit of the Spirit. He wanted you to be an expression. Now, <clears throat> Adam and Eve walked in the garden in the cool of the day with God. Mind, their mind was on was on the things of God and the presence of God. They could feel the presence of God. They operated in the fruit of the Spirit as normative. And then sin entered. Uh-oh. Did you notice that everything we would call a negative emotion manifested after they sinned? Fear, 
right? Hurt, rejection, and rejection hurts physically. It registers in the brain. Rejection, when they were rejected from the garden, rejection registers in your brain as physical pain. Hurt, fear, they hid, they were guilty, they were lustful, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. All of those manifested for the first time. It's not sin to feel that, but to harbor it, unforgiveness is the sin for staying there. You stay there, you sin. You walk in a huff, and just because you're not talking does not mean you're clean in the sight of God. <laughs> Banging on the drums and not talking is not quiet. <laughs> now, our emotions should be channels for the love of God. When we got saved, Colossians 1.13 says, we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So there's been a transformation. We've been entering into a new kingdom. That kingdom is identified as the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. All right, so you can identify it internally. The kingdom of God is within you, but you identify it internally. How's your internals? Today's internal medicine day. We're going <laughs> to, I'm an intern <laughs> because the kingdom was within. And so are you. Now, what is on the inside of you? Is it coming out or not? That's the question. Is it expressing? Is the kingdom expressing itself through you, or are there walls? You might be saved, but the walls keep it from being expressed. What's a wall? And you know what? From the time that I got filled with the Spirit, discerning the human spirit is as easy as breathing for me. And I, I was, it was always amazed me how people said, well, I've, I've forgiven them, and I can, I can perceive the wall. I'm going, oh, my goodness, if I can perceive the wall, I'm sure that person feels forgiven. <laughs> the only legitimate, note takers, write this down, the only legitimate wall is the supernatural wall of peace. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. It's the, it's the only thing to wear supernaturally. It's the only legitimate wall. The enemy can't touch through that wall. Do you know that? If you let peace guard your heart and your mind, he cannot penetrate the fruit of the Spirit. Now, kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is within you. Now, here's a statement we did when we traveled, and it kind of stuck with people who, you need some of this to stick. And if there's certain little ways of saying things that help it stick with you, it's for your advantage in the days ahead. But here's something. I want you to say it out loud back to me. Emotions are my friends. Did you know that that means even the bad ones? Why would a bad emotion be my friend? Because it's telling me Jesus isn't ruling right now. If it's hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, it's telling you, Gee, thank God you could feel that in one sense. You don't want to stay there because then the sin of unforgiveness comes. But at the same time, it's telling you Jesus isn't ruling right now. You want to get back there real quick. It, it's one of the healthiest things that could ever happen to you is to be able to feel. We always used to get a kick out of men. Some men were raised, boys don't cry, you know, that kind of thing. And so they b believe they don't feel. It's only women that feel. Well, I find that remarkably amazing. And like Jennifer says, well, they mean they don't have any good feelings. <laughs> I've seen them on the road, and I know they've got emotions. <laughs> Just not real good ones, not necessarily the fruit of the Spirit. All right. So emotions can be your friends, but the way you maintain a forgiveness lifestyle 
When we forgive, we're instantly restored to the supernatural peace of God. Never minimize that peace. And I know that there's a battleground, and I know that temptation comes to everyone, but it's tailor-made for you to get the victory over. If you see the same old, same old, there's even steps you can take to say, God, where did that get started? This is not a, a one-time thing. This is a repetitive temptation. Well, if it's a repetitive temptation, somewhere you gave into it, somewhere there's a root because there's the fruit. You don't say fruit without a root, good or bad. A good tree bears good fruit, bad tree, bad fruit. You see the same bad fruit over and over again, there's a root. You need to say, God, where did I give place to that and cleanse me of that? I receive forgiveness. It's not that hard. Where did I give in to that? Because apparently it's long-standing. Apparently it's habitual. What's the scripture for that? Beware lest any bitter root cause you trouble. A bitter root causes you trouble and defiles others. Uh-oh. You could have a bitter root and be blaming other people for their behavior when you're actually pushing to get that behavior. I've seen people with walls of rejection who basically walk around with the rejection and then complain that people reject them. Takes one to know one. <laughs> huh? Remember, the, remember the, the little girl that came up? My, one of my first altar calls as a young pastor, and she came up, and she had walls of rejection. And it was like, and I'm going, I can't minister through that. I can't make something happen. They got a wall up. And I just said, oh, well. I'm just going to stay here and release love. Loving intercession. I release love. And all of a sudden, I felt this. That's what it felt like, uh, like a trembling coming from them. And then it dropped. And your heart was open. God really does love me. You can't make that happen, but you can intercede. The, the, I think the step of faith she took was, I expect to be rejected, but I'm going to go forward anyway. That going forward anyway was like, if you are willing, you shall know. John 7, 17. The problem I see in the church is a lot of times we insist on knowing, and then we will do the will of God. No, no, no. John 7, 17 said, if you are willing to do, you shall then know. You've got to prepare your heart and be willing. Then you'll know. And quit demanding to know before you decide whether you'll be willing or not. Hmm? So, bitter roots pushes other people to sin against us. It says a bitter root springs up and causes you trouble and defiles other people. And uh, the funny thing about rejection is people with rejection will blame all those people for rejecting them. When you're the one pushing away. You're the one with the wall. It's discernible. Roots have a tendency to drive habits. If you've got a bad habit, there was a root somewhere that was a repetitive issue, and that repetitive issue just... Eventually, it takes on a life of its own. It just... That's the way I, oh, that's oh, my favorite. Well, that's the way I am. If it's carnal, bring it to the cross. Don't sit there and use that excuse, that's the way I am. Well, that's just the way I am. Just to have a person that would convince me that they love me over and over again, and it never, ever felt like anointing. I've been trying, but it's a push. It's a push. And it's not real. Love releases. Love does not push. Love has a freedom built up in it. 
when we, used to, when we traveled, we had to take a scripture or verse out of the Living Bible to get people to teach them how to let go. Because they interpreted let go as relinquishing all responsibility. No, no. There's a spiritual way to let go. Romans 14.4 in the Living Bible. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him and not to you. And God is able to make them tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. That's for all the movers and the shakers and the pushers. There's some things you cannot do that only God can do. And he's, you don't, he, parents, you don't even own your children. You are given them as a steward. They belong to God. I love that. Even in the Didache, in the early church, they made it quite clear from the Old Testament scriptures the children are inheritance of the Lord. They belong to Him, not to you. Your children belong to God first, you second, and you're a steward, not an owner. Yikes. Well, don't tell my daughter that. I can hear some mother go, don't tell my daughter that because I, I want her to, I'm going to make her do what I want her to do. <laughs> okay, good luck. I've watched that over the years in the pastorate, watching, especially teenagers. You are not leaving the house dressed like that. And then they get around the corner and they dress whatever <laughs> way they want to. I hate to think it, but you're not general manager of the universe. I know you campaign often for that office, but you can't do it. Only God is the general manager of all the universe. All right. So roots can drive habits. What I like, and this is the way to approach your individual life if you really want to grow supernaturally in the supernatural peace of God, do not self-analyze. Quit analyzing. Head Christians always shoot themselves in the foot with their much analysis. Try Psalm 19. Try what David, David was pretty successful in the kingdom of God in, in, in obeying God. God said, here's a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Why not take his approach? He, he let God search his heart. <gasps> not him. He didn't do navel staring. He didn't figure himself out. He wasn't thinking, I got a book and I know what to do now. He says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep your servant from presumptuous sins that they might not rule over me. Then I will be upright and innocent of great transgression. You know what I love there too? The Didache taught it. In uh, the Old Testament confirms it. Is the fences. Search me for secret faults so I don't commit the big blunders. You know the first thing the Didache taught was thou shalt not commit adultery and murder. That's the biggie. But they don't just fall out of the sky. They start with the little foxes. They start with if you would put up a fence and deal with it when it's little, it's not going to happen. You commit adultery, you didn't, you, you didn't minister effectively to the little lust all along that you stuffed and fought and battled and refused to give up. You didn't murder anybody just because it was an impulse. You have an anger problem that you've really never dealt with. And maybe you didn't physically murder, but you sure have murdered people with your heart. And they said, fast and pray. Do good to them that hate you. Ooh, it will change your heart and you won't be a murderer. Instead, you'll see that they're the victim. They need Jesus. That's how it'll change your heart. They're the victim. Or you can nurse your wounds your whole Christian life. There are Christians been in the church for years and years and years and they're still nursing wounds. Good luck. It's not going to go anywhere. Jesus is the solution, but you won't go to him. You want what? What do you want? Revenge? Recompense? What do you want? But ultimately, God wants to cleanse you. I want to pray. I would do altar ministry with this. But you can do it in your seat. 
You can do it any way you want to, but I'll tell you what we need. We need an exchange life. I've prayed this on, on Sid's program when we were on there with our new book, and it's the strongest anointing. You've got to graduate from the child to the young man to the fathers. And that's a work of the cross. That's not just something, okay, I'll do that. And what we really need is to move from any childlike behavior in our Christianity. Enough's enough. There's going to be an influx of people, and you reproduce according to your kind. You can only take them as far as you are yourself. And I'm saying that what we need is a definite work of the cross today. Why don't you stand to your feet right now? And if you're watching by YouTube, I want to do two things today. First, I want to pray that we graduate for any childishness in us. Your sins are forgiven. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. I speak to you, young men, because the Word of God abides in you strong. You've overcome the wicked one. You're living in victory. And I speak to you, fathers, because you've known him who was from the beginning. And you're an expression. You're an expression of the love of the Father. Father, right now we're going to pray for an exchanged life. If you're watching my video, this is probably the most important part of this whole message. The exchanged life is a, an experience of Galatians 2.20, that it is no longer I, that independent I. It is no longer that living the Christian life in my own flesh. It is no longer I that live, but Jesus the Messiah in me. It is from this day and this moment forward a we. When I say me, it's always a we. When I say I, it's the new creation I. It's not the I of my flesh. It's not that you. Apart from him, you, that you can do nothing. But I can do all things through him. So it's the we expression of the new creation. And I welcome a work of the cross. I receive forgiveness right now. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I receive forgiveness for trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. And I'm not going to take credit for it like it's some kind of a banner. It's not, it's not an award to live the Christian life in your own flesh. I receive forgiveness and deeply receive and welcome the presence of God to cleanse me of my sin of trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. As a mover and a shaker, as a trier. And I am welcoming that exchange right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here it comes. I am receiving a replaced life <laughs> from this moment on. It is no longer I. If you feel bathed in the Holy Spirit, that's a supernatural transaction. It is no longer I that lives, but it's now become a we. I'm an expression. So now when you love, it's a we that flows out of my heart. When I forgive, it's Jesus the forgiver and me joined together out of my belly flowing rivers of living water. It's a we that forgives. I'm releasing forgiveness to whosoever right now. Any person's face flash in your mind right now doesn't matter whether you understand it all or not. Out of my belly, I release loving forgiveness. Remove any, any barrier between me and them right now. Anyone that's uh, attacked me verbally, anyone that's harmed me in any way, shape, or form, anyone that would be considered even remotely an enemy, I'm letting the powerful love of God flow out of my innermost being like a fire hose, like an like a torrential outpouring of rivers of living water flowing in their behalf. They're the ones that need Jesus. They're the ones. Change my heart to see them, and I'll have no enemies. Bless them. Pray for them. If that's spitefully used, speak well now. To speak well of people that have spoken ill against you right now, bless them. You can say that out loud. I bless so-and-so. You can say so-and-so if you don't want to say their name in front of anybody. 
I bless you know who, God. I bless. I'm letting a river of blessing flow out to them. I'm speaking good words to them. Push back the powers of darkness around them and the hurt and the woundedness and allow the love of God to penetrate. Push back that they can make a free will decision to humble themselves before the mighty hand of God. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Jennifer, come on up here. Hold on, pray. Now, if there's someone that actually feels like they need to come up here, I want you to come on up. I feel like I want that affirmed and reaffirmed. I want to be able to bear witness with your spirit. Come on. Okay. I want to feel. I'm going to use discerning of spirits to basically see if you have that. There, you got it. You got it. There it is. See, that, that's easy to discern. And I drink it in, and I am welcoming the change, and I'm going to walk in relationship to that. Anybody else? I want to basically feel your spirit that you have that assurance that you just prayed for the transformed life. Yeah, very good. Very good. Very good. All right. All right. Anybody have physical ailments in their body? Yeah. Jennifer's going to pray for you right now. She's got an anointing for healing. Physical problems. Come on. Well, you can pray too. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, dear. <laughs> I can pray you too. Have an thank for you. Healing too. Physical healing right now in the name of Jesus. They who began a good work are going to continue that good work. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Praying for physical healing for those that are watching by Ustream YouTube. Yeah. We welcome them. There you go. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yield. There you go. We're going to lose Terry. We're going, we might lose you right here. See what you're doing on the inside? That's yielding. And it's discernible. Doesn't that feel good? Doesn't that? Yeah. Good. Doesn't that feel good? Real good. That's yielding. We're just going to teach you how to yield. Once you have your own nose, so you don't need someone else. Yield. That's it. That's it. Right there. What you're doing. That's the way God wants you to live. Yield. That, that right there. What you're doing right there. That's yielding. Okay. Let's move this way. There you go. There you go. Yield. Yield. That right there. Yielding. Yielding. You. We're going to lose. I don't mean to raise my voice, but sometimes I feel there's yielding and then there's letting go. Remember, you don't yield to a man, but you yield to the mm -hmm. Jesus in you. Thank you. Yield. Thank you. That's it. You're doing it. Yield. You yield down in the gut. You let go. I yield. You're trying a little bit. Don't try. This isn't something you try to do. This is where you relax. There you go. That's it. You feel his presence increase. That's all you need to do. You're yielding to Jesus in me. Don't you're not yielding to me. You yield to the Jesus in you. Oh, you're doing it, and I'm not even close to you yet. <laughs> you're yielding, yielding, yielding. We used to have people stand against the wall and fall backwards six inches. Be, oh, because it's unnatural to go backwards. You have to yield your will. So it's not about falling down. It's about yielding. Very good. Very good. Very yielded. That's where God. See, Rebecca's doing it real good right back there in her seat there. I want you to put a loser. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Increase. It's a nice, a nice. Whoa. whoa. Yeah, just take that. <laughs> take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Mm. Increase in the room. And your spirit feels that, right? That's, you know what that's called scripturally? Bear witness. My spirit bears witness. It doesn't mean I own it. It means I can perceive or bear witness to something. I've seen too many people confused between owning it 
and bearing witness. <laughs> oh, there you go. That piece. <laughs> That's nice. That's very nice. Very nice. Let me catch these people down here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Oh. I'll pray. You can <laughs> let Jennifer pray. To you. <laughs> me, there you go. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. There you go. All these people got the joy bubble over here, but they're afraid to let it out. That's okay. Some of us are more reserved than others. We got to pray for Stina's foot. Hobble on up here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We just release physical healing to flow to that body in Jesus' name, head to toe, literally head to toe. And we just release healing for that foot. Pray for Jason's back right now while there's a nice healing anointing going on in here. Pray for Jason. He say, take up your bed and walk. Well, don't lift it if you don't have to, though. Just get up. <laughs> And walk in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on up. Physical healing. Yielding. Oh, beautiful yielding. Hmm. You know, when you can yield to God real easy like that, that means you have very little difficulty trusting God. People that don't yield don't know how to trust God. They trust themselves more, but there's not one person that came up here that, that wasn't proficient at yielding. Isn't that good to know? Yeah. And what Jennifer needed was just when we were first married, she was doing stuff but didn't know what it was or how to do it. And I say, there, that's it. After that, you don't need me. Like, Yes, that was yielding, what you were doing, I would say, what you're doing right now. Once you've got that inner knowing, because how are you going to read that in a book? Once you bear witness that you can do it, you own it. And you've got it. And you can get back there. Jesus' name. Amen? All right, you can go home and be blessed. We're going to receive another. We're going to receive another offering. <laughs> You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.